1987, David Packard established Mabari to bring engineers and scientists and operations people together to carry ocean science and engineering into the 21st century. Designing and building the flyer showed us who we are and how to do it. The ship was vital to forging the, the unique personality that this institution has. We had kicked around possible names. The name comes from a Monterey fishing vessel, the Western Flyer, that John Steinbeck and Ed Ricketts took on a scientific expedition down to the Gulf of California in 1941. Immediately, everyone recognized, yes, that's it. Mr. Packard had encouraged us all along to try new things, not be afraid to go beyond what was comfortable and conventional. And so the flyer itself was an experiment. The whole process of designing and building the Western Flyer was a contentious experience because we, we had a gaggle of people involved. The discussions became rather uh, dynamic and contentious at times because everybody is jockeying for space. Scientists think they need so much space. For an ROV controller, I wanted so much space. There was a lot of arguments. Everybody had their opinion, of course, of what they wanted, but everything was built specifically for the science end goal. We had to learn to work together, to reach a goal, to get a ship, to do science, to develop technology. We were aware of a design called a SWATH, which stands for Small Water Plane Area Twin Hull. And it promised great stability and speed and lots of room inside. And it was a new concept. Um, David Packard decided this is what he wanted and this is, they were gonna, you know, go down this route. It's not a catamaran, but the machinery all goes down in the submerged hulls, and you have a small structure, you might say, transition between the, the ocean and the, and the bulk of the vessel. And so wave impact is minimized. So you have a more stable boat that doesn't pitch and roll like a monohull does. Agreeing on a basic design was an important first step, and it did a lot to, to forge the character of the institution. The next step, of course, was putting it together and making it work. Among the things that we were working with were remotely operated vehicles, ROVs, devices that would allow us to enter the habitat with instruments and cameras and manipulative capabilities. But we needed a platform from which to deploy those, those ROVs. The flyer was actually built purposely to support the ROV. The boat was not built to be a boat on its, on its own. It was actually meant to be a system with the ROV. We would build an enclosed area over a moon pool that would allow us to launch through the center of the ship. Because right in the center is where the boat moves the least. And so there's less up and down on the umbilical and pull on the ROV. To have a moon pool like this, to launch a very large work class ROV, in such a small ship was brilliant. And it works great up to a point. If the waves get going just right, they come together hard, they go like that and water will shoot up. It'll hit the ceiling. Usually you get some warning. When the waves are big, your ears will actually pop from the pressure as a big wave rolls through and kind of compresses the air in the moon pool. That particular one, you know, you didn't. <laughs> The notion of a moon pool was pretty uh, radical for, for scientific operations, and yet we moved forward with that, and it turns out to have been uh, a great decision. You could fix things on the vehicle without worrying about getting rained on or having your material blown away. The flyer has gone through quite the evolution here. It's not a static ship. You know, we had some issues when it was first delivered with cracking. And and then with the addition of the strut, that improved things drastically. 
made everything much more stable and much more durable. And as we got used to that, we start to explore and see new places. We began to yearn to take her farther. One of the places that was most appealing for conducting research was the Gulf of California. It was exciting, but fraught with challenges. There were any number of things that we had to learn the hard way. The grounding in Mexico, I was gonna say an exciting time. I don't know if that's the right word. Very stressful time. So I was on the bridge when it happened and there was no question <laughs> that uh, we had run aground. We uh, sent the engineers down to see if there's any damage. The port 3512 space was filling up with seawater. It hit a reef and it's taking on water and basically emergency time. Ishmael, the Mexican diver, he went down with what's called splash zone. And splash zone is a two part epoxy that you mix together and then it sets underwater. So he was taking the splash zone and going down and they patched all around that rock. That's how they got it to float and off the rock and then into the harbor at Pichilingue. It is a MacGyver moment, but that's life at sea, I'd say, for anybody. Uh, there's no help coming. You only have the resources that are on your ship, and you have to make it work. During one of the northern expeditions up to the Juan de Fuca area, which is a very heavily studied area because of the black smokers and the hot vents, so there's a lot of big seas out there, and so a lot of times you get uh, weathered out. There was one instance when there were several different science organizations on ships up there. These are big ships, 250 to 300 feet or more, all hovering around much the same area. And at 20 knots or more wind in six foot seas, because they're monohulls, there's a lot of movement. I don't see it's called wow, waiting on weather. The captain got on the radio and asked them what they're doing, and they reported that it's too rough, we can't dive. He called back and said, well, do you mind moving off that spot? We can dive in this. Then there was a long pause. <laughs> They're going, yeah, right. And nobody knew Mbari at the time or as well. You know, they were, we were just that little oceanographic institute on the West Coast with their cute little twin hull boat. Here we are, the Western Flyer at 117 feet, about a third the length of these other boats. We were gonna launch. It was within our weather window. They moved out of the way and Western Flyer came in. We launched through the moon pool and they had a super successful dive. That was probably one of the pivotal moments when we started to be recognized by uh, other oceanographic institutes. When the flyer came on board, basically it opened up a whole new world for us. Instead of being able to explore to one mile deep, now we can explore to two miles deep. You're really out in the open world untethered from the regular environment or day-to-day -day life and are at a place where you can really focus on but also be immersed right into the environment you're wanting to study or learn more about. When we're seeing something completely different or completely new, we have legit paparazzi moments in the control room where we've got everybody with their cameras on their cell phone taking video or imagery of what we're seeing. Every time we go out to sea, we learn something new. Maybe a new species, maybe a new behavior, some new type of observation. It's kind of incredible to think of all of the things that we're seeing in this little nine square foot dark room for the first time. And in some cases, the only place that they've ever been seen by a human is in that little space on the ship. The green bomber worm, the first bioluminescent sponge, first bioluminescent pteropod. I mean, there's this huge long list of things where we first observed them in that little dark room on the Western Flyer. And one of the enduring challenges that we've had here at Mabari is to be able to document what we can see with our own eyes, but have not been able to record on video. Well, Steve Haddock has been working with the engineers for years to come up with a high resolution, low light camera that will allow us to see, record, and investigate bioluminescence. 
almost everything is able to make this bioluminescent light and it's the most predominant form of communication actually on the planet because the deep ocean makes up most of our planet. And yet we know little about how it's made and all the functions that it serves. That's what's exciting about uh, going out on the Western Flyer. I mean, every time that you go out, you just don't know what you're going to see. We go down 4,000 meters, and you just don't know what you're going to find that deep in the water. Really the most unexpected thing that I found on the Western Flyer was the tusk of an ancient mammoth. We were all pretty incredulous because, you know, if we had just been going five degrees to the left or right or five meters off that position, we would have just gone right by and never known it was there. One of the animals we do a lot of work with are called giant larvations. These animals are really cool because they're about 10 centimeters long, but the mucus structures that they secrete and live inside can get to be up to a meter or two meters across. And what's really incredible is that they play a direct role in sequestering carbon. So what that means is that they play an important role in regulating climate on our planet. One of the challenges in understanding the impact of climate change on the ocean is that we have very few baselines for what the environmental conditions in the deep sea are like over the period of years or decades. And so the value of instruments like the Benthic Rover is that it can provide these baseline measurements that allow us to look year to year, allow us to compare to surface conditions, environmental conditions, and see how those changes are impacting the deep ocean. As the ocean warms as a result of climate change, its capacity to hold oxygen diminishes. And as we see the temperatures rising throughout the ocean, we can predict that there will be less oxygen. David Packard had a vision that all the video and images that we collect on our research missions will come to a central location. It'll be part of our core data and it'll be archived and managed. And in that way, it's available to everybody at the institution and it's really easy to share with our collaborators as well. After 35 years, we now have almost 28,000 hours of deep sea video we've observed about 245 new species, including one species that was named in honor of the Western Flyer. It's a really amazing deep sea bone-eating worm that's found on the carcasses of dead whales, and its name is Ossidax Western Flyer. The Western Flyer allowed us to redefine the way that deep ocean science is done. She's been instrumental in changing the shape and the course of deep ocean science. The things that we can look to accomplish and the way that we go about accomplishing them. You talk about the legacy, it was just this idea, right? Ambari was just this idea uh, of a very forward-thinking man, David Packard. I think everybody thought, why? David Packard believed that it was the idea to move forward and try new things, and that's been the great thing at Ambari. Today also marks a new beginning for the Western Flyer as we transition the ship to the Florida Institute of Oceanography. When I found out the Western Flyer was actually going to an oceanographic institution that was going to continue its legacy, that made me feel great. And even better, the whole mission now to bring diverse students onto the ship and to do telepresence so that it can expand the experience of the cruise. I mean, I think that's really an ideal landing place for the Western Flyer. Through that legacy, we are now entering into a space, a chapter, where we are getting ready to have a program that is dedicated with a vessel that is dedicated to providing access, affordability, co-creation of science for diverse communities. 
we are embarking upon a space that is going to give us the opportunity to really create change uh, around diversity, equity, and inclusion in ocean science. One of the things that I hope the flyer is able to do in its next life is not just to get kids excited about these career possibilities in ocean sciences, but to actually get them excited and aware of career possibilities in ocean engineering. We're being super intentional about making sure that our students not just come through our program um, and, and have this great experience and get introduced to ocean science, but as equally as important of going back into their communities and sharing what they learn. All the very best of luck to our wonderful new colleagues at FIO. Um, all the best to you.